Wage Labor and Capital by Karl Marx. This is chapter seven and chapter eight. So chapter seven, the general law that determines the rise and fall of wages and profits. We have said wages are not a share of the worker in the commodities produced by him. Wages are that part of already existing commodities with which the capitalist buys a certain amount of productive labor power. But the capitalist must replace these wages out of the price for which he sells the product made by the worker. He must so replace it that, as a rule, there remains to him a surplus above the cost of production expended by him, that is, he must get a profit. The selling price of the commodities produced by the worker is divided, from the point of view of the capitalist, into three parts. First, the replacement of the price of the raw materials advanced by him, in addition to the replacement of the wear and tear of the tools, machines, and other instruments of labor likewise advanced by him. Second, the replacement of the wages advanced. And third, the surplus left over, i.e. the profit of the capitalist. While the first part merely replaces previously existing values, it is evident that the replacement of the wages and the surplus, the profit of cap capital, are as a whole taken out of the new value, which is produced by the labor of the worker and added to the raw materials. And in this sense, we can view wages as well as profit for the purpose of comparing them with each other as shares in the product of the worker. Real wages may remain the same. They may even rise. Nevertheless, the relative wages may fall. Let us suppose, for instance, that all means of subsistence have fallen two thirds in price, while the day's wages have fallen but one third for example, from three to two shillings. Although the worker can now get a greater amount of commodities with these two shillings than he formerly did with three shillings, yet his wages have decreased in proportion to the gain of the capitalist. The profit of the capitalist, the manufacturers, for instance, has increased one shilling, which means that for a smaller amount of exchange values, which he pays to the worker, the latter must produce a greater amount of exchange values than before. The share of capitals in, product, in proportion to the share of labor has risen. The distribution of social wealth between capital and labor has become still more unequal. The capitalist commands a great, greater amount of labor with the same capital. The power of the capitalist class over the working class has grown. The social position of the worker has become worse, has been forced down still another degree below that of the capitalist. What then is the general law that determines the rise and fall of wages and profit in their reciprocal relation? They stand in inverse proportion to each other. The share of profit increases in the same proportion in which the share of labor, wages, falls, and vice versa. Profit rises in the same degree in which wages fall. It falls in the same degree in which wages rise. It might perhaps be argued that the capitalist class can gain by an by an advantageous exchange of his products with other capitalists, by a rise in the demand for his commodities, whether in consequence of the opening up of new markets, or in consequence of temporarily increased demands in the old market, and so on. That the profit of the capitalist, therefore, may be multiplied by taking advantage of other capitalists, independently of the rise and fall of wages, of the exchange value of labor power, or that the profit of the capitalist may also rise through improvements in the instruments of labor, new applications of the forces of nature, and so on. But in the first place, it must be admitted that the result remains the same, although brought about in an opposite manner. Profit, indeed, has not risen because wages have fallen, but wages have fallen because profit has risen. With the same amount of another man's labor, the capitalist has bought a larger amount of exchange values without having paid more for the labor on that account, i.e. the work is paid for less in proportion to the net gain which it yields to the capitalist. In the second place, it must be borne in mind that, despite the fluctuations in the prices of commodities, the average price of every commodity, the proportion in which it exchanges for other commodities, is determined by its cost of production. The acts of overreaching and taking advantage of one another within the capitalist ranks necessarily equalize themselves. The improvements of machinery, the new applications of the forces of nature and the service of, pro of production make it possible to produce in a given period of time with the same amount of labor and capital, a larger amount of products, but in no wise a larger amount of exchange values. 
If by the use of the spinning machine I can furnish twice as much yarn in an hour as before its invention, for instance 100 pounds instead of 50 pounds, in the long run I receive back, in exchange for this 100 pounds, no more commodities than I did before for 50. Because the cost of production has fallen by half, or because I can furnish double the product at the same cost. Finally, in whatsoever proportion the capitalist class, whether of one country or of the entire world market, distribute the net revenue of production among themselves, the total amount of this net revenue always consists exclusively of the amount by which accumulated labor has been increased from the proceeds of direct labor. This whole amount, therefore, grows in the same proportion in which labor augments capital, i.e. in the same proportion in which profit rises as compared with wages. Chapter 8. The interests of capital and wage labor are diametrically opposed effective growth of productive capital on wages. We thus see that even if we keep ourselves within the relation of capital and wage labor, the interests of capital and the interests of wage labor are, di are diametrically opposed to each other. A rapid growth of capital is synonymous with a rapid growth of profits. Profits can grow rapidly only when the price of labor, the relative wages, decrease just as rapidly. Relative wages may fall, although real wages rise simultaneously with nominal wages, with the money value of labor, provided only that the real wage does not rise in the same proportion as the profit. If, for instance, in good business years, wages rise 5%, while profits rise 30%, the proportional, the relative wage, has not increased, but decreased. If, therefore, the income of the worker increased with the rapid growth of capital, there is at the same time a widening of the social chasm that divides the worker from the capitalist, an increase in the power of capital over labor, a greater dependence of labor upon capital. To say that the worker has an interest in the rapid growth of capital means only this, that the more speedily the worker are, augments the wealth of the capitalist, the larger will be the crumbs which fall to him, the greater will be the number of workers that can be called into existence. The more the, can the mass of slaves dependent upon capital be increased. We have thus seen that even the most favorable situation for the working class, namely the most rapid growth of capital, however much it may improve the material life of the worker, does not abolish the antagonism between his interests and the interests of the capitalist. Profit and wages remain as before, in inverse proportion. If capital grows rapidly, wages may rise, but the profit of capital rises disproportionately faster. The material position of the worker has improved, but at the cost of his social position. The social chasm that separates him from the capitalist has widened. Finally, to say that the most favorable condition for wage labor is the fastest possible growth of productive capital is the same as to say, the quicker the working class multiplies and augments the power inimical to it, the wealth of another which lords over that class, the more favorable will be the conditions under which it will be permitted to toil anew at the multiplication of bourgeois wealth, at the enlargement of the power of capital, content thus or content thus to forge for itself the golden chains by which the bourgeoisie drags it in its train. Growth of productive capital and rise of wages, are they really so indissolubly united as the bourgeois economists maintain? We must not believe their mere words. We dare not believe them even when they claim that the fatter capital is the more will its slave be pampered. The bourgeoisie is too much enlightened. It keeps its accounts much too carefully to share the prejudices of the feudal lord who makes an ostent ostentatious display of the magnificence of his retinue. The conditions of existence of the bourgeoisie compel it to attend carefully to its bookkeeping. We must therefore examine more closely into the following question. In what manner does the growth of productive capital affect wages? If as a whole the productive capital of bourgeois society grows, there takes place a more many-sided accumulation of labor. The individual capitals increase in number and in magnitude. The multiplications of individual capitals increase the competition among capitalists. The increasing magnitude of increasing capitals provides the means of leading more powerful armies of workers with more gigantic instruments of war upon the industrial battlefield. 
the one capitalist can drive the other from the field and carry off his capital only by selling more cheaply. In order to sell more cheaply without ruining himself, he must produce more cheaply, i.e. increase the productive forces of labor as much as possible. But the productive forces of labor is increased above all by a greater division of labor and by a more general introduction and constant improvement of machinery. The larger the army of workers among whom the labor is subdivided, the more gigantic the scale upon which machinery is introduced, the more in proportion does the cost of production decrease, the more fruitful is the labor, and so there arises among the capitalists a universal rivalry for the increase of the division of labor and of machinery and for their exploitation upon the greatest possible scale. If now by a greater division of labor, by the application and improvement of new machines, by a more advantageous exploitation of the forces of nature on a larger scale, a capitalist has found the means of producing with the same amount of labor, whether it be direct or accumulated labor, a larger amount of products of commodities than his competitors. If, for instance, he can produce a whole yard of linen in the same labor time in which his competitors weave half a yard, how will this capitalist act? He could keep on selling half a yard of linen at old market price, but this would not have the effect of driving his opponents from the field and enlarging his own market. But his need of a market has increased in the same measure in which his productive power has extended. The more powerful and costly means of production that he has called into existence enable him, it is true, to sell his wares more cheaply, but they compel him at the same time to sell more wares, to get control of a very much greater market for his commodities. Consequently, this capitalist will sell his half yard of linen more cheaply than his competitors. But the capitalist will not sell the whole yard so cheaply as his competitors sell the half yard, although the production of the whole yard costs him no more than does that of the half yard to the others. Otherwise, he would make no extra profit and would get back in exchange only the cost of production. He might obtain a greater income from having set in motion a larger capital, but not from having made a greater profit on his capital than the others. Moreover, he attains the object he is aiming at if he prices his goods only a small percentage lower than his competitors. He drives them off the field. He wrests from them at least part of their market by underselling them. And finally, let us remember that the current price always stands either above or below the cost of production, according as the sale of a commodity takes place in the favorable or unfavorable period of the industry. According as the market price of the yard of linen stands above or below its former cost of production, will the percentage vary at which the capitalist who has made use of the new and more faithful means of production sell above his real cost of production. But the privilege of our capitalist is not of long duration. Other competing capitalists introduce the same machines, the same division of labor, and introduce them upon the same or even upon a greater scale. And finally, this introduction becomes so universal that the price of the linen is lowered not only below its old, but even below its new cost of production. The capitalists therefore find themselves in their mutual relations in the same situation in which they were before the introduction of the new means of production. And if they are by these means enabled to offer double the product at the old price, they are now forced to furnish double the product for less than the old price. Having arrived at the new point, the new cost of production, the battle for supremacy in the market has to be fought out anew. Given more division of labor and more machinery, and there results a greater scale upon which division of labor and machinery are exploited, and competition again brings the same reaction against this result.